Welcome to the Four Eyes Podcast, brought to you by Young OD Connect. We give you a clear view into the new grad optometry world across Canada and the US. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Deepan Carr. And I'm Dr. Amrit Bilku. So just a heads up as well, my dog is here with me. So if he makes noise, I'll try to calm him down. But that's no Rick getting rid of this guy, unfortunately. Oh, that's okay. Oh. I'll bring my dog up. Maybe they <laughs> <Yeah>. can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Devinder, thank you so much for um, finding the time to come on our podcast. And for some of the listeners who may not know you, because I'm sure most people should, since you're very popular on Instagram, <laughs> um, can you tell us more about yourself for the listeners? Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me on. I'm really, really happy to be here and for the warm welcome as well. You didn't need to do that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm Dr. Sidhu. Graduated from PCO in 2015. I spent a couple of years as a traveling doctor and as an associate, and now I own a couple of practices and do quite a bit of consulting for private practice startups. So that's kind of my niche now. Did you travel like internationally as like a doctor or was it just kind of like around different clinics? I did, I did uh, a trip to Haiti when I was a student, oh, uh, nice. but, but afterwards I did basically indigenous camps up north so uh, mm -hmm. northeast cool. northwest british columbia Haida Gwaii, so kind of the remote places so people that didn't even have access to like normal health care so we'd go there with a big team of different specialties and kind of do our thing that is so cool we need to do like a part two of this episode and talk about <laughs> like remote clinics and these kind of communities that's awesome yeah, yeah, yeah. it's definitely it's definitely life-changing it also makes you a better doctor but uh kind of helps you develop the empathy part a bit more. I feel like you oh, really yeah. learn the struggles people go through and it challenges your clinical skills, but also your yeah. human, your human side of things as well. So I definitely re recommend anybody to do that if they get the opportunity. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think for like new grads and young ODs who are just trying to decide on like what steps to take in their career and mm -hmm. what sort of jobs that they want to look for, like that's the thing, rural opportunities are hardly ever taken, right? And like, that's where the care is needed the most. And it you're right, tough. it really does strengthen your clinical skills, your knowledge, your um, like problem solving, and just like, yep. you know, thinking quick on your feet, being creative, all that stuff. So that's amazing. Good for yeah, you thank, for doing that. Thank you. And then the other, just to add a tidbit to that, like even uh, my practices, two of them, they're up north. And so when I practice in the lower mainland of British Columbia in the city, I find like my clinical skills after a while, you know, it's just myopia, dry eye. There's nothing crazy that keeps you on your feet. And then I go up to my clinics up north and I'm like, oh my God, any ION, oh my God, this. Yeah. This person has a stroke. Now I'm 20 minutes behind. Oh, now this person has, you know, an injury to their eye. The hospital referred them. So mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage everybody if you ever get an opportunity to practice remotely because it, it makes you the best doctor, but uh, it also teaches you to basically be more efficient with your time as well, which, which pays off dividends outside of clinic as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And also how to handle high levels of stress probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of walking around the clinic thinking I'll say that much. I, I pace a lot when I think so. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a, sometimes you'll see the other doctor as well. You just got a pacing in the hallways. I'm like, what do you have? They're like, oh, I have this. I'm like, oh, I have this. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what do we do? Yeah. Um, Okay, but just, just to get started, Devinder, so yeah. when we think about measuring productivity in an office, what specific metrics do businesses typically keep track of, and how is this data interpreted to assess productivity across all team members? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I just want to give a disclaimer about this. Uh, there's no right way to do this. Everybody has their own preference. I kind of will talk about what's worked for myself and uh, things I do when consulting for clinics. It's going to vary really on the type of clinic, you know, if you have a retail side or if you're just a non-dispensing clinic, um, all the different modalities will have a different approach to this. But productivity in my eyes is measured three ways. One is obviously the doctor side of things, the staff side of things, and then a combined metric. And the reason why the combined metric is important is because you may find that certain doctors work better with certain staff members, and that could help you kind of schedule people accordingly end of the day, it is a business, you do want people to be happy with who they're working with, but also having certain people work together that have better metrics could lead to higher revenue for the practice as well. So we're all human. We all get along better with certain people. No one's going to be 
100% friends with everybody. People do put that aside and work towards the end goal, which is obviously uh, doing what's best for the patient. But if you can make things more comfortable with them by using those combined metrics, it does pay off. So that's number one. Um, essentially, in my point of view, you should never have more than five metrics for any type of thing you're measuring. I feel like, you know, if you guys have seen my post, I always write five reasons, five things like that. For myself, I feel like if I can count it on one hand, that's easy to stick to. I, I can stay on top of things. But if you start stretching it out into like 10 or 15 metrics, like some people recommend doing, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So in my eyes, in keeping with the staff productivity, the doctor productivity and the combined productivity, I could dive into a few metrics here. Uh, I do understand that this is a little bit more complicated without having like a numbers in front of you to kind of understand things, but I'll try to simplify it, but just let me know if you need me to slow down on any of this. Um, so first thing I like to do is obviously gross revenue per staff hour. Uh, that's a very big metric because it helps you see essentially how efficient your patients are managed by your team. Um, certain employees will have better metrics than others that could help you figure out who to put on a busy day. For example, in lower mainland or your Friday, Saturday, and even Sunday, if you have a high foot traffic area or very, very busy. So if someone is generating a higher metric for that, I would be foolish not to try to get them to work on a Saturday or a Sunday because it's going to lead to more revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, these types of decisions, I feel like majority of business owners in optometry don't think about. They think more like, oh, this person's better staff. Maybe I'll give them a raise. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's warranted as well. But you should also try to put them in a situation where it's going to allow you to generate more revenue. And potentially, you can incentivize that revenue to that same person. So you're both winning from that. So little things like that can go a long way. Um, in terms of other things, the, for doctors, gross revenue per OD hour, very similar. Uh, how productive is this doctor for every hour they're working? This is a pretty good metric uh, because it also helps you plan if it's worthwhile adding another day. If, for example, if you're only open five days and you're thinking of opening, you know, four hours on a Saturday, 10 to two or something like that, you can look at it and say, well, you know, this person or this associate generates this much per hour that leads me to this much revenue. Mm -hmm. How many staff members do I need to put in to kind of make sure that I at least break even that day? Uh, so the numbers like that do help as well but also comparisons between doctors is the main thing, right? So you want to build a benchmark of what's considered normal for your practice. I always get asked, give me a number for this. And there's no number for this. Every clinic is different. You have to obviously gather data over time and build the historical data for your clinic and then kind of find what the median is and utilize that long-term. And then also get your doctors to try to work towards that. If you have someone coming in and they're struggling a bit, you want to coach them to try to get to that revenue per hour because then you know, hey, this is kind of what's normal in our clinic. You know, how can we assist to get you there? What are you struggling with? So it kind of helps everybody on the team kind of move along. Any questions on that part at all? Yeah, I was going to comment on um, the metric where you yep. focus on the combined metrics, right? What's yep. like what staff members work with each doctor. I never thought yeah. of that until you said it because I, I work at a private practice where um, during the pandemic and lockdown, you know, the office extended their hours and yep. we ended up working in teams. So yep. there's two teams in the office, you know, certain staff members are with the same doctor in the same team. And yep. it's funny because I never thought about it every day. I'd go to work and I'd be with the exact same receptionist, exact yep. same pretester. And then all of a sudden that pretester is sick or the staff member takes the day off. And so yep. then the other team is working with me and the whole day is a shit show. <laughs> because yeah. then, like we're just not in sync anymore. Well, and so, yeah, it, you're right. Yeah. It kind of, you know, you develop that relationship with certain staff members who just like understand you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. There's, there's both sides to that argument though. I totally agree. You, you have good chemistry with certain people, but this is where the, some people chime in and say, well, shouldn't your doctors be able to work with any of your staff? So there's mm -hmm. kind of, looking at both sides, but in, in my experience, yes, we should be able to work with anybody, but look at anything you do in life. If you've ever played sports or anything, you're going to do well or have better chemistry with certain people. Yeah. If your end goal is to generate more revenue, why would you not try to put those same people together more often? Yeah. So that if there is someone sick, it's just a hiccup. It's not something that's permanent for the business, right? So yeah. Um, yeah. 
but uh, it also makes people happier. That's what I found. Doctors like working with certain pre-testers. They know how they like things. And it just makes life easier for you. So you don't have to yeah. step in and coach anybody on anything as well. So it's like better yeah. flow. Yeah. It's not to say that I don't like working with the other team. I love the whole yeah. staff team, but you just have that synergy with that one, you know, staff member who knows yeah. what you want in your schedule. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's so true. I, I like that tip. It brings a better vibe to the clinic too. Cause if you have mm -hmm. such a good chem, like good chemistry with the person you're working with, other patients can see that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk Definitely. a lot about vibe on our, on our podcast. <laughs> so vibe I just is very brought important it into too. this episode <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah. But yeah, that totally ties into it. I feel like when you have um, good chemistry with other team members, yeah. it just, the whole day just turns out really great. Yeah. And you're yeah. right. You're the workers are really happy and then they're yep. excited to come to work the next day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and yeah. this kind of ties into a lot of things. I'm not sure if you guys look at my posts on Instagram, but I talk of a lot. Of course we do. <laughs> <laughs> they're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I talk a lot about the process. I, I haven't talked about as much on the post yet, I think, but when we consult on clinics, everything for example, if I've ever been asked to consult on a clinic by a friend or anything, I typically will just walk in with a coffee, not tell the staff who I am, yeah. see how I'm greeted, assess everything. Oh, I'd like to book an appointment, ask questions, see how things are handled. Because in the customer journey, you know, it starts obviously when they start researching you and seeing, you know, what is your brand like? What's your website like? What's your Instagram like? Uh, what are your Google reviews like? But once they step foot in your door, they're more likely to a convert and buy something mm -hmm. and b be happy on the way out and leave you a good review. So yeah. uh, those are things that, you know, it's all part of it. And, and like you said, if the vibe is good, that's more likely to happen. Right. So that's, yes. that's, that's always a good <laughs> it's thing. All about the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. So Devinder, you mentioned like the metrics uh, when yep. we compared the doctors too, right? Like who's producing yep. revenue per doctor hour. Um, yeah. Since we are young ODs and most of us are associate ODs, not really practice owners, um, are mm -hmm. there certain metrics or certain numbers that us associate ODs can kind of focus on maybe to even better negotiate our position within the practice or to, you know, bring in certain products that we want to motivate the owners to maybe add services that we want? Any Any tips on that or any metrics that we can be paying more attention to? Yeah, I mean, right now... Uh, I will just say one thing. I, when I was an associate, I always thought like, oh my God, this owner works me so hard and you know, he or she must make so much money. And yeah. now being on the other side, it's not true. Like you don't make as much money as people think. <laughs> the margin is less and less every year. Like, yeah. for example, I always tell people rural, rural clinics, 25% net income plus or minus five. City clinics, 20% net income plus or minus five. That's what it ends up being at the end based on your gross. Now I'd say it's even less. The reason why is payroll is up, cost of goods is up, every mm -hmm. single thing in life is up. But when you, by God forbid you raise that eye exam price by five dollars, <laughs> you're gonna have a riot at your door, right? So <laughs> your your, mar your margin yeah. is thinner and thinner. And uh, that being said, your question is great. If you as an associate could bring another revenue stream to an owner, they would be foolish not to look at it. And the reason mm -hmm. why I say that is, in my experience when I was an associate, I took opportunities like this to my bosses and they kind of shut me down. Uh, reason why people shut you down is number one, they're unfamiliar with that product or service, which is completely okay. I'm a primary care optometrist. I know nothing about VT. I, I commonly admit that. If someone were to bring to me and say, hey, Dave, we could do VT. I've looked at the instruments. This is what it costs. I, why would I not look into that? It's it's another revenue stream. I have someone who's interested in it, someone that could champion that role and do it. But the main thing to focus on is how to generate more revenue for the clinic and your boss will always listen. So I kind of want to jump into that a bit uh, to how yeah. you should do that. Um, so how do, you, how do you generate more revenue as a doctor? If you think about it, well, there's a few ways. Number one is increase your output. So you're going to have to see more patients. You're going to have to work more days. Your conversion is going to have to go up or you're going to have to bring in more patients yourself through personal branding. So that's one, right? The other way to increase the revenue for the clinic is a new revenue stream, right? So that's something that could be done in addition to these things, but your boss is going to be hesitant to do that. So I, I wrote some notes down here just to kind of talk about what I would like to see. For example, if someone came to me, 
Uh, I would like to ask, first of all, how much revenue can this bring in per month and how much revenue per patient can we expect mm -hmm. to see for this? What type of volume are we talking here? Is this going to disrupt our normal chair time for complete exams? Or is this yeah. something that could be done in a secondary exam lane? Can staff be trained to do this or does this have to take up doctor chair time? Because that's a very big question to have when figuring out revenue. In terms of conversion, how many of our existing patients would be good candidates for this? And how many do you think would convert on that? Because last thing you want to do is spend 50 grand or 80 grand on an instrument and then rely on marketing to get new patients. You want to make sure you do have some internal patients that'll do that. Yeah. So uh, I always like to use this example whenever I've, I've been asked a similar question before. So for example, dry eye is big in our industry. Okay. Almost every clinic is getting into it. So let's say you notice like, Hey, we're selling eye drops. We're selling, you know, omega threes and masks. Uh, maybe we should try to get into IPL or RF or some sort of treatment modality. Your boss goes, I don't know, you know, sounds expensive. I don't really have the time. Well, what you can consider doing is say, Hey, look, why don't we set up a questionnaire in our pretest, mm -hmm. see how many people are actually have symptomatic dry eye. You could then also see how many of those patients are converting on your nutraceuticals, your eye drops, all that. Mm -hmm. And then you could take that number and go do some market research, see what people are charging in terms of fees locally and what the reps are recommending. And use a spreadsheet and actually figure out how much revenue you're going to generate based on that conversion. You then take that to your boss and say, Hey, look, Dr. So-and-so, this is what we could potentially have just off existing patients with zero extra marketing. So yeah. the doctor is going to look and say, Oh, wow, we can make an extra five grand a month just out of the gate. Why? Oh, that's amazing. And they're more inclined to do that. And it also helps you have leverage now when you negotiate, because I personally would give, my associate doctor a percentage of everything on that. That's mm -hmm. how I am. I feel like the experiences I had as an associate, I learned how not to be an owner is what I'll say. So yes. if you are coming <laughs> with this idea and you could champion it, I would say if you do all the training, I will help with the marketing. If you do all the training, I'll give you X percent of each fee that comes in for this. And yeah. most doctors would say, great, let me go calculate that. Then they might come back and negotiate negotiation is always a good sign. Okay. So if someone doesn't negotiate, I'm always like, okay, right. But uh, <laughs> overall, that's how I would handle it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I could go back as an associate, I did something similar, but if I can go back now, I would do it a lot more detailed and include who does it locally, how much they're charging. I would even do some mystery shopper calls and see how far mm. out they're booking. Uh, if they offer package pricing, get all the details honed in. And that way, it can get you a treatment that you might be obviously interested in, but also help you generate more revenue because you're going to start getting a cut of all those fees as well if you negotiate that. I love how you answered that question because you literally gave a step by step. a step by step process of what to do when they want to bring in a specialty service into the clinic. So anyone yeah. who's listening and who's interested in that, this is this was like the perfect template to do that. Yeah. And <laughs> I yeah, agree. Like that's awesome. Cause I feel like if I wanted to bring in something, I'd be like, okay, perfect. Like I know what to bring the owner, like what kind of information I need to yeah. you know, give out there for, to convince them to bring that service in. Yeah. yeah I'd because, feel more confident doing it. So that's because perfect. Because prematurely I've had, I've been approached by associates over the years too. And they're like, Hey, we should get, for example, at one of our clinics associated with like, let's get an IPL instrument. And I was like, okay, how many of the patients do you have that are interested in it? how many do you think would convert out of that aren't showing interest to have you done any research into that and uh, all the questions all the answers are no no yeah. no yeah. what do we yeah. charge for what should we charge for that in this local area i don't know so i was just like okay i was like well if you want it look into that and i will look into it myself as well but when you start to see someone take that initiative and they do get those details yeah especially yeah. without asking you like as an owner like you love having that person part of yes. your team and and you value that person. It's yeah. it's very weird when you see people get turned down by their bosses because it just doesn't make sense to me. It's not good business. Uh, like yeah. I said, you learn you learn how not to run a business when you work certain yeah. places. And I feel like you learn the most from that part of working somewhere is what yeah. not to do. Yeah. Yeah. That that yeah. sounds like me asking my husband, can we buy stuff? And he goes, Do you need it? What does yeah. it do for us? I don't know. We just need it. We just need to spend money on it. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I do have a couple other tidbits on this part too, just yeah. for you guys. Uh, so met, originally, I think you asked what metrics. I kind of went on a tangent about the the instruments there. So mm-hmm. metrics for associates, I always recommend looking at like your gross revenue for a complete exam. That's a key one. Uh, this is great because it analyzes your uh, production as not just the clinical side, but also the retail side as one. Mm-hmm. Um, so it allows you to compare yourself to other doctors in the practice. Uh, com- internal competition is good. It doesn't mean you need to be talking to them or texting them like, haha, I made more money than you this month. But <laughs> you should, you should be, you should be trying to compete with your peers. Okay. I feel like that's good. A healthy competition is great. Also complete eye exams for hours. Another one I like to always look at. I find some doctors unnecessarily follow up a lot. Uh, mm. so for certain things, for example, if you're a new clinic, I understand you're going to follow up with almost anybody. If you have someone that's a mild dry eye, you're going to bring them back because you get the billing and you get mm-hmm. to build rapport and trust with the patient. Mm-hmm. But if you're an experienced clinic and you have someone that you're just telling them to, you know, use warm compresses and hypochlorous and typical dry eye stuff, and you have a full load already of complete eye exams, why are you bringing them back for a follow-up? You should be telling them to come back as needed. And, you know, like, we're here for you. Anything bothers you, come in as needed. Because essentially you're wasting chair time for a complete mm-hmm. eye exam for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so that's just my look at it. Uh, some people might think that's unethical. I don't think that's unethical at all. Um, I think it's basically if you were comfortable without seeing that person again, and you're not doing anything that's not good optometry, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's more, it's uh, more efficient. It's more efficient yeah. exactly. that way, right? Yeah, it, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. the next one is obviously your conversion rate. You always want to look at conversion rate in, set, in general. So uh, industry norms, about 65%. So about like two and three people will convert typically for most clinics. Um, what what does convert mean? Like what what is the conversion number? They'll make a, they'll make a purchase. So okay, two out of three it. people will make a purchase. So whether that be eye, uh, you know, eye products, accessories, mm-hmm. or eyeglasses, uh, okay. that's a pretty typical number is uh, 65%. Uh, it all depends. I've, I've seen clinics that convert like, one out of every two. I've seen some as high as like four out of every five. So the higher that number, the more revenue you're going to generate. It's pretty yeah. straightforward. Uh, your average order value or AOV is another one I always like to uh, talk about as well for associates because it's going to really vary based on what you discuss in the exam room. This is something that is not taught enough to young ODs. If you have a discussion in the exam room about different products, specifically name lens designs and the actual brand of that lens, and you do a proper handoff to an optician, that person is more likely to purchase that lens and that design. And that lens design, you're not selling it to because it makes you more money. You're selling it because it fulfills a need of your patient. So so you're not being a salesman. You're you're providing a solution to a need they had. They might have been wearing a general use progressive lens and you find oh wait you're an accountant maybe we should get you in a shorter design in a wider corridor you're Mm -hmm. fulfilling a need for them and that product might cost more but your aov your average order value just went up so Mm -hmm. that's another thing to look as well because how do you calculate revenue it's how many patients you see times your average order value times your conversion rate so if you can Mm -hmm. if you want to make more revenue for the clinic you have to increase those three things so if you can do that you're more valuable now to that practice. So always try to talk about products that helps get up your AOV. And lastly, your, or not lastly, but second last recheck rate is a big one. The young ODs, oh my God, stop over plusing everybody and stop changing the <laughs> cylinder. I can't, I can't get over it. I, oh. I, I, I feel like in optometry school, they always teach you like maximum plus. Like, yeah. yes. it's like maybe for like, Boards, no, but in reality, minimal plus. Okay. So- no, yes. <laughs> Actually, Deep on and I um discussed that in depth um in our first episode of the season yeah. coming back on. Yeah. Like we shared some clinical tidbits, and yeah. I think we said no more plus, like stop <laughs> with the plus and trial frame every single trial frame. RX trial also- frame. Also, by binocular cylinder check, people don't yes. do that enough. They will change mm-hmm. it in one eye, and then yeah. oh, it's great. But it's like if you change it back closer to their hab RX, and they don't complain with two eyes open, you are good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, seriously. But re- recheck rate, the average is about fifteen percent for most clinics. So almost mm-hmm. one in six pairs is is not made properly. Wow. Uh, 
most efficient clinics that I've consulted for are down to about 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, so about one in 20 pairs will be incorrect. Keep in mind, recheck rates don't fall all on the doctor. It does fall on the optician as well, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of a combined metric, but mm -hmm. you do see trends. You will see like, you're like, hey, that optician's pretty experienced. Why is this one young OD got like 10 RX checks? So you do kind of have to coach uh, people as well. I feel like people always forget the good old red-green duochrome test that yeah. does help, right? So uh, yeah. people need to utilize that more. Uh, the last metric I would use, because like I said, you always want to use like five max. I think I might've gone six, but uh, units per transaction, you want to sell more than one pair if you can. Uh, mm -hmm. And once again, I don't mean sell. People might look down on that, but uh, it starts by asking essentially, you know, what is the patient's needs? What do you do for a living? Do you have any special hobbies? Uh, I've found that the average person does not like their progressive lens for hobbies. So yeah. if you have a progressive lens sale, you should always fish about hobbies because if there's someone who's an avid reader or they do sewing or crocheting or something, they almost always will be like, you know what? I just can't use these progressives. And mm -hmm. a single vision reader is simple to dispense. Uh, it's going to increase obviously your income as well if you're getting a commission on it. And it's also going to help that patient be happier you'll find that that patient yeah. will likely buy two pairs of glasses every time they come mm -hmm. and then amrit i think it was you uh, i saw the analogy about shoes i, I love that analogy. yeah yeah, yeah because, that's because my favorite yeah, it's my favorite too uh yeah. one of our clinics yeah i use it all the time poster. it works <laughs> it does we, yeah, we actually does. have a poster at one of our clinics that has like <laughs> literally it's like a pair of heels and there's another pair of heels and it's a, you wouldn't have just one of these, right? So, ah, uh, yeah. and, it's a, and a lot of patients always comment on it because it's true. You need more than one pair of glasses, right? And I find what um, really helps in the exam room to really show that patient. Um, I do educate my patients on the importance of having uh, definitely a separate pair of glasses for mm -hmm. their computer desk. I'm like, I don't yeah. care who you are. I don't care what you do all day everyone will benefit from a computer prescription that just yep. sits in their drawer. And once you've sat down on your monitor in front of it, you know, you put those ones on, even if that prescription is a quarter or 0.5 mm -hmm. different than their regular, you know, everyday lenses, I'll put that plus 0.5 in front of them. And they see that little bit of extra visual clarity, mm -hmm. the little bit of comfort. And I tell them, I'm like, not life-changing. See, very small yeah. change, but you feel more comfortable. So mm -hmm. this prescription is for the computer. And then I remove it and say, see, when you look far, this is your everyday prescription. So even showing those minor quarter changes, you will convince the patient with, with less effort to, you know, get that second pair. So that's really helped. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. That's, that's a very good point. Uh, trial framing like that is uh, always a no brainer. Also, like, like you said, less chance of a recheck as well. So <laughs> yes. it works both ways. So yeah, that's all I have basically on that question. I know I went on a bit of a tangent again on some <laughs> things, but <laughs> no, no, tangents are good. <laughs> tangents are great. Yeah. <laughs> For those optometrists who may feel uncomfortable with sales, do you have any tips on how to increase confidence in sales or even how to change the perception of office sales? So when we hire young ODs, especially if they're fresh out of school, we kind of coach them the same way. Uh, we go through a few things. And number one, I tell them is try to focus on your patient's needs. It's, it's a mm -hmm. perspective you need to have in mind. A lot of times, especially when we're students, we go to a private practice and you realize, you know, they're kind of pushing the glasses on people, this and that, and it feels really foreign to you. Uh, so I always say, try not to focus on sales, try not to focus on that. What does your patient actually need and how can you provide that solution for them? The end of the day, glasses are a medical device. So that's another thing as well. People forget that sometimes, even doctors, mm -hmm. like it's a medical device. The person needs this. How can you tailor it in a way where A, they will fulfill their need and live a better life and improve their quality of life by wearing those glasses? So that shift in perspective makes, I feel like people do a better job on selling those glasses, even though... Um, you know, it's something that they might not have been comfortable with doing initially, but changing that mindset does go a long way. Um, second thing I encourage all young ODs is learn your products. Uh, a lot of young ODs do not know the different pro progressive lenses, the differences mm -hmm. between the Nikons, Hoya, Shamir, Esler. You need to know the comparatives of each one. What are the mid tiers across the board? What's the difference between them? What's the high tiers across the board? What's the difference between them? Uh, if someone has 
you know, keratoconus or corneal issues, which type of lenses decrease the aberrations or work better with high sill. These are things you need to know. Uh, and the reason why you need to know them is because if you are knowledgeable in front of your patient and you're recommending something to them, it shows a level of confidence, but also helps them build trust in you. So mm -hmm. if you're sitting there, you're like, oh, you know, I can, I guess we'll put you in a progressive lens. You know, there's three types. Usually there's like a good, a better, a best. I would say get the better. That's the common pitch every eye doctor does. And yeah. it doesn't work that well. Mm -hmm. Instead, if you say, look, Jane, your last eye exam, it looks like you bought these Hoya lenses. And uh, those were actually on the lower tier. And I do understand that you work on a computer it'd be better to put you in a wider design. If you want to stick with that same company, we do offer uh, an upgrade on that lens. This is what it could do for you or how you could benefit. In addition, if you do want to switch, there is another company called Essler, which has very good products as well. Uh, in my mind, both are great products, but I will recommend either type of those lens for you. And we can go talk to the optician and they'll help you get set up with that. Sim simple as that. And the patient goes, oh, actually, you know what? Like, yeah, let's upgrade this. I didn't like these ones. They're going to walk out with you. You're going to do the handoff. And, and there you go. You just fulfill the need for the patient. And the next time they come in, they're likely going to purchase that same quality of lens again. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the third thing I always tell people is you need to listen to your patients. It's mm -hmm. one thing I've noticed yes. that it drives me insane sometimes because I'm in the room with young ODs when we first hire them just to kind of help with their efficiency. Mm -hmm. They don't listen to the patient. A lot of times they're in their head trying to get the exam done, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God, like I haven't done IOPs yet. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, you're not listening to the patient. Just listen to what the patient's saying. Yeah. So they'll, yeah. they'll rush the refraction and the refraction is what the patient is there for sometimes. Like they don't <laughs> mm -hmm. care about anything else. They're healthy and you're rushing the refraction. It's like, no, no, can I see that one again? And they're trying to get them dilated. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're not in school anymore. It's okay. You could be a little <laughs> yeah. bit late. It's okay. They'll understand. <laughs> Listen to what they're describing about their visual needs. Cater to that. And that is making it not a sale, but you're fulfilling a need and you're providing a solution. Start changing your perspective. Yeah. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, last thing is communication with your optical staff. This is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, I've oh noticed gosh, certain, yes. doc certain doctors do better with certain opticians because they might get along better personality-wise. But yeah. you need to have a conversation in the exam room, like we just discussed about the lens types and the products. You then need to walk your patient out, do a, a proper introduction to the optician. Like, hey, mm -hmm. this is Jane. She's, uh, she's coming back for a second time. Last time we happened to put her in, you know, this type of lens. And we're thinking today of upgrading it to uh, this design. As, uh, as you know, it's a little bit wider corridor. Going to help her get into that reading area a little bit better as well. So if you don't mind helping her out with that, uh, and then she is currently dilating as well. So I'll, I'll come grab her after. Thank you so much. Simple as that. You're handing the baton to your optician. Your optician now echoes the same thing you said. They mm -hmm. complete the sale and your patient is happy and you just earned your commission. So simple as that. And then after you also want to talk to your optical staff, like, hey, you know, like, uh, did this, did people say anything? Because a lot of times mm -hmm. the people that don't convert, you could learn a lot from. Yes. Uh, I've, mm -hmm. I've noticed when I was younger, sometimes uh, some of the clinics I was at, they were very like push, 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 sell, sell, sell. So I, you get into the modality of sometimes being a little bit pushy, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so your feedback is like, oh, they, they didn't want to buy glasses because they thought you were just telling them to get glasses for no reason. Mm -hmm. And why did that happen? Because I didn't actively listen. I didn't ask what their needs were and I didn't mm -hmm. provide a solution. Yeah. Right. So that's kind <laughs> so of what true. I tell people. Do those three things and it'll convert almost every time. Yeah. Yeah. I do have Seriously. a question about ODs who like are working at multiple places. Yep. Mm -hmm. I feel like it would be hard to kind of remember what lenses each kind of practice oh, yeah. has. It's not as difficult as you think because a lot of these companies, the reps will provide you like a chart with comparables. Right. So, That's like, true. For yes. example, like, like our yeah. opticians, we just give them the chart. It literally says like Nikon lenses. It'll say like the different tiers of progressives and the Esler comparables, Hoya comparables. See, yeah. I'm, then, I'm so happy we have this episode that these are things that like, <laughs> we really haven't like dived deep about. into before. Yeah. And we don't learn these things in school. We don't yeah, learn we these don't. things in our careers because, you know, mm -hmm. our owners are not going to talk about the business metrics to us. They're just going to be like, why, why don't they though? We talk I think about that our there's a lot of like, I think there's a lot of detail. So you like yeah. even talking about one thing 
is like there's like so like many a elements minute answer so, for like so we, but it's so for, important we for our associates uh we actually meet with our associates bi-weekly and talk about how their metrics are doing like hey you're you got to pick it up on this part you're normally up here what's going on is there mm -hmm. something with the staff side are we understaffed overstaffed how you need to find out what's going on because you know historically what your benchmarks are and 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 you need feedback from your team like is it because yeah. Are we understaffed or what's going on? Tell us, right? And how could we help? And then we go check with the manager, like, hey, what's going on here? Why are we not meeting this target? And you need to help find a solution, right? So uh, I think uh, I personally would recommend every business owner to discuss metrics with their associates. Uh, some people may not feel comfortable, but that's just the way we do things. Well, yeah. our practice yeah. does too, but I'm just never yeah. at those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what happens when you, you work at five different places. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 quite hectic. I, that's, I literally that's work at my the private practice that I'm at right now. I'm there from yeah. Monday to Wednesday for yeah. two and a half years now, and their yeah. meetings are Thursdays. And so oh, I'm wow. just <laughs> you're not there. <laughs> nope, I don't know where this person left. Why there's promo on the window? Why the exam? When the exam fees change? I just come in and I'm like, all right, guys, a really important yeah. point, because if I feel like if the owner is not really meeting up with the associate OD to be like, hey, like, is there something going on here? Or let's review mm -hmm. the numbers. Yeah. Sometimes the associate OD will be like, yeah, everything's good. I think I'm good. Like, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, like you there's no feedback. There's you no feedback. So yourself. you're not everyone wants to know how to improve. And then yeah. I think that's yeah. like important to that's... have those biweekly meetings or monthly meetings, whatever, just that's... to go over mm -hmm. numbers. And to give like constructive advice on how to maybe improve yep. things or to give positive, exactly. positive feedback and be like, you did really great here, but yep. let's like discuss this part and see how we can and, improve that. And sometimes the thing too is like, uh, you realize that it's not the OD that's underperforming. It's your staff sometimes that's underperforming, yeah, that right? Too, so, yeah. so that's the main thing. Like if you look at things, like what's going on he or she's usually up here. Why is she down here for the last month? then you kind of dive into it with the manager and they might've had to hire someone or fire someone. Then it makes sense. Right. So you can't take mm -hmm. that as a way of, you know, when you talk to your associate, you can't think that they're doing anything less. They're still working mm -hmm. hard and doing their job, mm -hmm. Yeah. but it, but it helps you figure out what else could be causing that. So it, it really helps you see like the pulse of your clinic, uh, yeah. which is why met, which is why metrics are very important. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another thing as well for the uh, glasses sales thing, I'll just add in uh, while, while we're still almost on the topic is, Questionnaires are important. Uh, I'm not sure, Amrit, if you are going to be adding questions about glasses on your... Oh, I'm like all about designing report. my infographics and brochures sure. and checklists. <laughs> like I have yeah, everything ready like to are. go for our practice coming up. So Manraj is a very lucky business yeah. partner. I am the marketing person. <laughs> you seem very organized, which is very yes. good. Uh, on, your, on your checklist, you ask questions about their current glasses and if they're interested in buying glasses. Not if they're interested in buying glasses, but um, add, I, I am going to adopt the habit of um, like the practice I'm in right now. Anytime yep. we book an appointment for anyone new or returning, we ask, are you interested or currently wearing contact lenses? And mm -hmm. are you going to be shopping for glasses? We can, we can have some time um, for dedicated for you in the optical. Yep. So we kind of yeah. already pre-book them. So we'll know that oh, they'll be in the yeah. optical. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it's great. That's very good. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good solution. Uh, another one we recommend in new clinics is on your questionnaire, always ask how old are your current glasses? Are yes. you happy with them? Yes or no? And then lastly, are you interested in looking at new glasses today? That way, mm -hmm. when you see that questionnaire, if they're like, I hate my glasses, I want new glasses, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to spend as much time talking to them about things, just ask yeah. them what their needs are, fill it. Uh, you don't need to dive into too much, especially if you're behind schedule, you don't want to take the extra five minutes. Mm -hmm. but it really helps you build a roadmap for your day as well as, as what I was trying to say with the questionnaire. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hundred. I, I think there should be questionnaires for everything. Like, yeah. I wish I could give every new patient like four questionnaires <laughs> to fill out before pre-test. Right. But you know, this is like your pre-appointment <laughs> before the actual. You, yeah. You appointment. Know, it's, it's funny when we always want that, but like I went to the dentist and I was like, Oh my God, I got to fill out 10 of these forms. Oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. There's like 10 sheets and you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a barrier, but yeah. Um, so Devinder, let's, um, yeah. you did mention, or we did kind of mention, you know, what's happening if staff or doctors aren't producing. Um, yeah. So let's switch gears a little bit. 
you know, in a practice, how many, you know, slower days or how much downtime do you think is normal or acceptable in a practice? And how do you incorporate that in business calculations? What can staff members and doctors do to still contribute to overall practice growth if if it's just slow? In terms of forecasting stuff, you'd never really plan for slow days on your forecast because when you build a pro forma or forecast, you basically look at how many patients in that month am I going to see, right? So mm -hmm. for example, if you're starting a new business, you might say, hey, I'll see 50 patients in one month one and it's going to grow 10% each month. You could get like one or two per day, then all of a sudden be stacked on a Saturday, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So yeah. you don't really account for slow days on on projections. But okay. if you do have slow days, uh, you would obviously want to do any administrative tasks you have. So like accounts receivable, get your recalls in, any orders are behind, do some deep clinic cleaning, organization. Uh, remodeling is a big one. If you're tracking foot traffic, what areas are the hot sellers? Try to mm -hmm. move your slower movers into that area to see if people respond and start purchasing those. Marketing wise, it's it's actually good to take advantage of those as well. So like yeah. send your letters to local GPs and, and local ophthalmologists to kind of network <laughs> if you're in your clinic. You can even go meet them. I would highly recommend scheduling time to meet local healthcare providers. Uh, in my experience, what I've always done is I provide a luncheon for their staff. So mm -hmm. I will call like a local family doctor's office and say, hey, look, like we're a new optometry clinic in the area, get a Subway luncheon, go there. It costs you like 50 bucks, buy some mm -hmm. Tim Hortons coffee, not the end of the world. Yeah. Go there, talk to them about referrals and what your clinic could take. And you got to remember a lot of these practices, it's their front desk that decide who they're going to go see. So if the front yeah. desk likes you, you're getting the referral, right? So it yeah. doesn't matter mm -hmm. as much. So give them notepads for referral, check off, you know, provide a checklist like poor vision, eye pain, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for the doctor to just hand it off and send to you. And the last and most important one, um, I did not start Instagram till the pandemic. <laughs> Build your personal brand, everybody. If you're a doctor, start an <laughs> Instagram or social media of some sort. Yeah. Start putting yourself out there because it's essentially when people Google you or look you up, they're going to find a few things. The websites you're on and mm -hmm. your social media, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. that could get you new new patients as well because uh, I'm not sure about you guys. Like, for example, I researched the heck out of the dentist I just saw. I looked up yeah. my, okay, she went to school here. She did this. Okay, she yeah. has reviews here. This is her, I this think is her we Instagram. do that too. Yeah. <laughs> I know her I mutual our generation friends. Always does that. Yeah. yeah. This is her Instagram. Oh, wait, we have three mutual friends. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're not the only people that do that. The average consumer is very, very well researched nowadays. So you got to yeah. build that brand. You can't just rely on a website anymore, right? Yes. Um, no, it's so uh, true. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, other things, you know, you could do like school screenings, church screenings, et cetera, on mm -hmm. slow days. But uh, yeah, uh, you, you can't really calculate that on projections is what I was trying to say in the beginning. Uh, yeah. I wanted to add something when you talked about um, Instagram and planning yep. your marketing content. What's a really good tip for anyone who is not heavy on Instagram or Instagram savvy? What's really yep. helped recently is that you can now schedule posts in advance can, yeah. on Instagram directly or mm -hmm. on meta business suite. If you're combining yep. your Instagram and Facebook page together, which for me has been life-changing because you've always had to use, you know, third-party companies yep. and pay those plans. If you want, you know, advanced scheduling yep. and it's right on Instagram now, guys. So if you're not using Instagram to market as much, now is the time because now you don't need that third party. And on those slow days, you can make all those reels, make the videos, make the posts, yep. and then have them planned on that calendar so that it's ready to go. And then for the whole month, you don't even have to think about it. It's already yep. done and ready for you. So yeah, just wanted to add that tip. Yeah, yeah. I schedule everything myself as well. It makes life a lot easier. Uh, the other thing I would recommend to people is, you know, it's, it's not easy to put yourself out there on Instagram. Even when I first did it, like you feel vulnerable, you get imposter syndrome, just know you're not alone. It happens to everybody. Uh, but getting started, getting your feet wet, you'll become more and more comfortable like anything over time. But, uh, just keep in mind too, that if you don't feel comfortable putting your face on there or talking on there, you can make content without that too. You can do carousels, informational posts. It doesn't have to be all about yourself, but getting started is the key because there's several big business people in the world that have said Instagram is the new business card. So 
essentially, mm -hmm. you know, having that out there and being accessible, uh, even if someone wants to send you a message or just even know what you represent, it's a good thing to have on there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important because I even remember working at a clinic and the patients picked wanted to see a specific doctor over the other yep. because the doctor was all over Google. Like, yep. like this person wrote, had content all over Google and the doc other doctor didn't. And it wasn't because there was any difference, really big difference between both of them. It was just the patients were like, well, we kind of know this doctor because they're all over yep. Google and everything and they have content on there versus this other one, which we haven't really heard anything about. Yeah. So, and I thought that was very interesting. I was, I was like, oh my God. I got to get yeah. myself on Google. Here. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I told Once my again. I told yeah. my business partner, I told Manraj the same thing. No one knows who he is because he's not <laughs> on social media. He's a very yeah. chill, you know, laid back guy who wants his life private. And I said, you're going to do TikTok videos with me. <laughs> you got to start doing these dances. And he's yeah. not looking forward to it. But now he sees the importance of, you know, yeah. I am on social media I can make announcements about the practice and people yep. are, you know, talking about it, congratulating us. And, and he really honestly just said, wow, like, I didn't know so many people already knew about our practice. I said, dude, yep. you have my Instagram. What do you mean? No one, like you didn't think anyone <laughs> knew, like, you know, you, that's how you develop the connections. That's how you reach out yep. to the public, the community. Um, so you don't have to be the best of the best on Instagram and you don't have to try yeah. and grab likes and grab attention, just put yourself out there. Just put your face mm -hmm. there. And then at least your patients will know who you are. You exist, you mm -hmm. care. Um, and then, and then they'll want to book an exam with you. Like it, it's, yeah. it's yep. great how they, well it if works. If they see your face and how you speak and like how you talk, it makes them yeah. more comfortable. Cause then they're like, Oh, they're like yeah, not socially awkward. Yes. Let's just go to it's, them. For yes. It's a part, it's a part of the customer journey, right? It's one yeah. of your brand brand touch points is when they look you up, that's what they see. Um, yeah. so Devinder, we kind of talked about this. We already mentioned that there's not much taught, uh, in optometry school about the business side. Um, yeah. what's your advice on specific resources for that? Or where would we go to get more information about the business side of optometry? Luckily, we live in a time where there's lots of online communities nowadays, right? So uh, once again, ask your colleagues and networks is something everyone says. But, uh, you know, social media moving forward, things like Facebook groups, like how they have like ODs on finance and like mm -hmm. uh, ODs on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You got uh, like eyes on eye care. You can go on their website. Uh, review of optometric business comes to mind. Eye care yeah. business is another one. Um, optometric management is another one as well, but these are, I'll be quite frank again, there, a lot of the stuff they provide is, uh, depends on for the online community, it depends how much people are willing to share. First of all, not everyone's yes. going to share their secrets, uh, because end of the day, you are competition, unfortunately. Uh, and then for the other websites as well, it's the same, the contributors themselves, they are going to share what they want to share with you as well. So a lot of this comes down to how can you start to look at the numbers of things every optometrist uh, whenever i hear an optometrist tell me they can't handle the business side i always laugh because i'm like you took optics you don't have to <laughs> yeah. you, I'm like, you, I'm like, you 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 solved these equations that are so hard and you have trouble <laughs> dealing with a simple graph right? like so and, and yeah. then when you say that people are kind of just like oh my god i never really thought of that i'm like yeah i'm like you never have to do U plus D equals V or any of that stuff. Here. Like, <laughs> this is this is this is all simple stuff. You have spreadsheets available. You can plug things in. There's AI now. Use Chat GPT if you're unsure. Use that to figure out yeah. formulas. Like there's so it, it's never been easier to do this stuff, right? So mm -hmm. uh, in terms of business management, there's tons of online courses you could take now. You could earn an MBA. You can get certificates, diplomas online. Uh, if you're if you're wanting to go the educational route, I personally think you don't have to do that. I think it's uh, something that I think as optometrists, you should be able to learn yourself if you put the time aside, because once again, you took optics, right? So yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the other books, there's the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. That's pretty good. Oh, uh, yes. There's the, yep. there's the e -Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Again, that's not bad. Key performance indicators, uh, the 75 measures every manager needs to know. It's mm -hmm. by a guy named Bernard Marr. He also has a YouTube channel as well that you can access and watch videos. Um, there's another YouTube channel I recommended to a young 
a dental friend of mine recently. It's called Measure School. So mm-hmm. it's on YouTube. It basically shows you how to measure different quantifiable metrics uh, of a business because nice. uh, business knowledge in general applies directly to our field. Uh, yeah. and it doesn't have to be all yeah. separate. I always tell people, separate your doctor mind from your business mind, right? Mm-hmm. So, and the main thing is remain ethical. You have to remain ethical. That's the one thing that you should never put aside when you're making any decisions when it comes to this stuff. But try to think of the business as a completely separate part from your clinic. That's so yeah. true. Um, and yeah. I think that's where the nerves and the anxiety comes in. Uh, not just as a young OD, even a seasoned mm-hmm. OD who does not own their own business and mm-hmm. practice. It's, you kind of feel like I already went through so much to become this one particular person, right? This doctor. Yeah. And now, okay, now I have to put in so much more energy to <laughs> yeah. become a second person. It sounds very like exhausting to just think I have to go through a second journey from scratch because I don't have a, you know, I might not have a program or a binder or notes to start from. I have to start finding all these resources and teach myself yeah. um, mm-hmm. at a slower pace because life still hits you when you're practicing in the real world. And yeah. um, so it can be very daunting to pick up a second hat that you have to put on, but For it's sure. definitely worth it. I'm learning that right now. I'm just starting to learn business and yep. um, it's it's kind of exciting, though, because it is. your practice does become your baby. So you really are like you're a parent, right? You're going to do anything and go above and beyond for what's going to help that practice grow just like a baby. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. For sure. And yeah. I, I just want to add, there's uh, typically in my experience, uh, just consulting with people, I've been involved in a few acquisitions myself, but also help people by consulting on purchasing a clinic or selling a clinic, you know, kind of evaluating it as well. And I feel like there's two types of doctors, mainly in optometry. Uh, One is the person that owns the clinic for the sake of being their own boss. And they just want to make all the decisions. It doesn't matter as much what the bottom line money wise is, as long as they can pay themselves and they get to run the show. And then there's the other side, which is I own the clinic. I'm the boss but I need to make sure that this clinic makes money and I use this as a business and I use this as an investment vehicle. Yes. Those are the people that retire earlier. Those are the people that get multiple clinics because they realize the tax benefits of having the business. Mm -hmm. They realize the retirement uh, aspect of having the business in terms of accruing wealth within that as well. Uh, And so there's both sides to look at this. Uh, You know, you can be the doctor that runs a business and doesn't care about about the business side, you're also going to be the one that has a harder time when it comes to retirement. So Mm -hmm. champion that role, take the time, learn these things. You went through school, you learned so much in school. It's not hard to add an hour a week, even of self-education at home to just learn these things because it could make the difference between retiring at 65 or retiring at 55. Yeah. Simple as that. So true. So, So keep that in mind is what I always tell people. So does that mean I can just call you every day for an hour, five <laughs> days a week. So you can just be my mentor. <laughs> Let, what are we learning uh, today, Davinder? <laughs> like he's uh, just uh, eating uh, dinner. Oh my God. Uh, uh, Emirates calling Emirate, me again. Like, Emirate, why? If, if you, if you know how Decline. many phone calls I get, you would, you would laugh. I, I, I have like 10 email addresses and like a million phone calls a day. So oh my uh, God. I would say I'm sure. based on how far out we scheduled this podcast, I think you'd have to schedule a call. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, (laughs) There was just so much amazing information in this episode, and I'm sure our listeners are going to be craving for more, or they'll probably have questions and Mm -hmm. comments, but is there anything that you want to finish off with that we might not have discussed earlier? I will say one thing. In this modern economic situation the world's in, it's okay if you're an associate doctor, you don't have to be a business owner. However, if you do want to be a business owner, just know that it's the hardest time ever in our lifetime to be one. So make sure you're ready, educate yourself, be confident, and just know that you will lose some sleep, but the end of the journey is worth it. Simple as that. Well, thanks again, Devinder, for coming on. Uh, We really appreciate it. And um, (laughs) yeah, we look forward to watching your other business venture grow. For anyone who's interested, Devinder recently <laughs> recently opened up the winery or is it 
is it opening it's up soon? under construction. So all the, all yeah. the wine is already in production, but uh, we're building the tasting room. It should be opening hopefully later this summer. So very excited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's called Vasanti Wine, right? Yeah. Vasanti yeah, Winery Vasanti Estate. in yeah, BC. Vasanti Estate Winery. Yeah. Thank you both for having me. It was really fun. And you guys, very laid back podcast. I enjoyed it. So if you ever want me on again, let me know. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening to Four Eyes, the podcast series brought to you by Young OD Connect. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram or YouTube at Four Eyes Optom for more content. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.